Welcome to the Backyard Professor Live show tonight. We are going to be covering some very interesting information. Let's get this show on the road. Welcome, everybody, and I'm glad you're here to watch this show because uh, we have an issue going on in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saintism, Mormonism, for those of us who don't care to worry about the whims of the current prophets saying the full eight-and-a-half-mile-long name taking 45 minutes to get through the dumb thing just because Jesus wants you to. I'm in a mood tonight. I'll tell you what, I stubbed my toe and I it, it hurts. I just about broke it. I'm cleaning up my yard and holy shish kebab, it hurts. Woohoo! So how is everybody? Peter Higgs, Tyler Boyce, RFM, Dan Vogel, Don, Doug Vincent, Landon Brophy, Rebecca, Biblioteca, Pat Ambassador for Truth Vega Dog. Yes, there's issues in the LDS church, I guarantee you. And uh, Alan, hey, Alan Zabriski, good to see you, my friend. Who else is here? Peter Higgs, yes. Wanda, Anthony, hello, hello, good to see you. I'm glad you're all here tonight. Um, tonight Noel Hausler, yes, yes, sir. Welcome from Australia. You too, Peter. Uh, good to see all of you. Yeah, Noel has asked me to, uh, in fact, I'll post this. Please help us, as Hales suggests, Smith was repurposing the facsimiles. Good grief. No, not good grief, question mark. Good grief, exclamation part, point. Brian Hales is clueless. Yes, you can tell him I said so. Quote me if you want. Brian Hales is clueless, just in case you didn't understand what I was saying. Joseph Smith did not repurpose the facsimiles. Joseph Smith translated them from the book of Abraham. Each one of those facsimiles say they are taken from the book of Abraham. Abraham's signature is in the hieroglyphics on facsimile number one, which they will not put into the book of Abraham as the facsimile, they took all the hieroglyphs out, and they shouldn't have. That is part of the story that the church, in its great ignorance via revelation, cannot grasp to this day because they refuse to read Dan Vogel's book on the book of Abraham, which I have reviewed and covered extensively in several of my videos. It's up here somewhere in front of me. Uh, I've got your book, Dan. I know you're here. Good. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, Skousen and Givens have given the light, have seen the light as far as the facsimiles are concerned. From my understanding, and, and I don't have any verification of this just yet, but uh, yes, there are some scholars who are calling for them to remove the facsimiles, which from my point of view is absolutely absurd. It cannot be done without completely killing off Joseph Smith, because what the, what is that going to tell people? Remove the facsimiles. What's that going to tell people? If you're going to remove the facsimiles, get rid of the damn stupid book itself because they came from that book, uh, according to Joseph Smith. Today's scholars are 
stuck in such a tight corner and it's making them squeal so loud right now. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight is some of their new attempts to try to save the book of Abraham. And I'm here to tell you flat out straight, as clear as I can, they cannot save the book of Abraham. This war is over. It's done as far as I'm concerned. And I'll, and I'll, so, I mean, it's not like I'm beating a dead horse. They keep trying to revive this stupid horse and all it is, it's not even bones anymore. It's morphed into a tape here for the book of Mormon's sake. Uh, it's just, it's amazing. If they do decanonize the whole thing, like Doug Benson is saying, it's over. It's a done deal. That tells you Joseph Smith couldn't translate that's like decanonizing the Book of Mormon. They can't decanonize the Book of Abraham. That will be proof positive that their Holy Ghost given testimonies are a sham. If you decanonize the pre existence, the intelligences, the line of authority and priesthood, Egypt being discovered by a woman while it was underwater, etc., you decanonize that. Mormonism has nothing because the Book of Mormon is tied directly into the Book of Abraham, regardless of what the apologists say. So this is part of the fun issue. This is what helps make this such an incredible uh, issue. I do consider the case closed. Landon Brophy, my dear brother and friend, good to see you again here, bud. Yes, I do. It is closed. It's over. It's done. Periodically, what I want to do, um, apparently there's an algorithm running around YouTube now and on Facebook, especially, et cetera, and they're just beating the hell out of us video makers. Uh, I am going to attempt to do some videos, but I cannot do any short steady videos every day anymore or anything like that. Um, they actually goof us up. And so what I'm in the process of doing, I will re-review all of the Book of Abraham materials, including, and I will begin with the new materials. Actually, tonight I'm going to talk about one of those new sources. Some of you are familiar with it. Some of you aren't. And I want to completely review this all over again. It has been a year since I did that. Can you believe that? It's been a year, you guys. Where did that year go? We haven't done a thing the whole year. So it's pretty important. Um, uh, Noel asks, don't you think their inspired account might console them? Yes, it will console them. It will demonstrate to the world that they don't know what inspiration is. Because inspiration has told them the book of Abraham is true. Inspiration has told them Joseph Smith translated that book of Abraham from the papyri. Joseph Smith himself claimed that. that if they do anything negative with the book of Abraham, this is the albatross that's hung around their head. They, It's over. They're done. They can no longer claim the book of Mormon's valid if they invalidate the book of Abraham, in my opinion. And, and that's part of what I want to do with this with this kind of a, a review type thing. So it is amazing. Uh, hi, Patty Kate. Good to see you. Pattykins, according to Doug Vincent and the Backyard Professor. Pattykins, that's a good one. <laughs> hey, Ray Lawler, how you doing? Donnie Lee Gringo. <laughs> Donnie Lee Gringo. I love your handle. That's awesome. Lee Mortensen, how you doing? Vega Dog, I have said hello to. Good to see you here. Mark Roach. Yeah, let's kill it then. Just decanonize the whole thing. Yeah, does anybody have facsimiles anymore? I don't know. That's a good question too. Uh, it's okay. Oh, thank you, Doug. Well, I'm going to upgrade them and, and update those Book of Abraham videos as well. Uh, the one thing I did a year ago that I was very happy with the way I approached it, although I was kind of getting back into the video world and I was really kind of like an excited little puppy dog and I was a complete amateur. <laughs> I still am, but I, I was too overly excited and I, I left out so much information, but I got the essentials across in a way that for me, what I was sharing with you is 
how things were clarified. I want clarity. And that is why I am taking to severe task tonight both Stephen Smoot and Kerry Mulstein for wasting everyone's time with their ridiculously stupid pap and pablum materials that they're producing in BYU studies. I suppose they could brag it gives them another publication in a scholarly journal if that's all they're looking for, but the information is essentially useless and I would like to explain why. And in fact, let me jump on to this. I hope you guys can still see me. I'm reading this. I can't see you, but I am going to read this. This is their article, Prophets, Pagans, and Papyri, the Jews of Greco-Roman Egypt and the Transmission of the Book of Abraham. BYU Studies Quarterly, 61.2. So they say that Egypt has a long history of exchange and contact with a variety of people, and they had diverse ethnic backgrounds, and it didn't matter what kind of people they were. Now, importantly, the theme, the time frame here is they want to say during the reign of the Ptolemaic. Now, the Ptolemaic is the Greek pharaohs. Okay, so during the time of the Greek pharaohs. Now, this is 300 BC to 30 BC, and well into Roman dominion, which is 30 BC to AD 350. So, this is the time frame that they're going to explore a subject with the book of Abraham. There was an unmistakable Jewish presence throughout Egypt, as if that means diddly squat, but they want to make a big deal about this, and well into Roman dominion. And we have found this through the surviving historical and archaeological record. Yeehaw, we have confirmation that Jews were in Egypt. So flippin' what? I'm going to be sarcastic tonight on purpose because Smoot and Mulstein are pulling our collective legs. They're trying to attempt to pretend, <laughs> there's no other better word that I can give, that there still is relevance with the book of Abraham. And here's the kicker, and I know this, and now you all will know this, and I will challenge them directly online in a debate bait if they think I'm bluffing. I know they know better. They know they're wasting time in this article. They know this article does nothing for the mainline issues with the book of Abraham and Joseph Smith's involvement with the book of Abraham. This is pap and pablum extraordinaire. It's a waste of time. However, why would I address something that is a waste of time? Because many of us still do have loved ones in the church. Many of us still have friends, family, neighbors who will come across this material and feel like, oh, well, this is a historical support for the book of Abraham. And so I can continue reading in confidence that this is a book of scripture. And, and therefore, of course, Joseph Smith is still a true prophet. There are still many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who find this type of information validating. I do not. I will say flat out, I know Stephen Smoot and Kerry Mulstein are bullshitting us here too. They do not find this validating at all either. And let me explain why I know this. I get this in their article, truly. So anyway, let us go on through their pap and pablum. Thanks to the relatively abundant discursive evidence, the Judeans of Hellenistic Egypt have been described as being one of the best known of the many minority immigrant populations long settled in Egypt by the time of the Greco-Roman era. Who cares? I mean, when it comes to dealing with the book of Abraham, none of this is relevant. 
They're going to try to make it relevant, though. So let's uh, let's see what's going on. So now, and this is the part, the three or four paragraphs in. I'm skipping and jumping because it's a complete waste of my time and yours. Now they get to the important fluff. The cultural setting of Greco-Roman Egypt may be interesting to members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in its own right. Well, let's take a look then. But knowing more about it may help them better understand a possible transmission method for one of their scriptural texts. So here we go. This is their setup. Now, and I'm going to click back here to the stream yard so that I can see myself, see you. Um, they have to truly. Oh, I didn't know I had that on the screen still, Noel. Sorry. They have to. They are literally. Oh, Steve Acosta, you are so kind. Thank you. In behalf of my friend Lewis Midgley, he donated $100. Thank you. I appreciate that. That is very, very kind. Uh, so um, the reason that the Mormon apologists slash scholars, I hesitate to call them scholars. Yes, they can quote some cool stuff, but that doesn't make you a scholar. The reason they are forced to explore the Ptolemaic era. Now, this is this is the era after Alexander the Great conquered the world, men died, and then his kingdom was split up into three kingdoms. The Ptolemaic era, uh, the Ptolemaic area was Egypt. Okay. The reason they have to, the reason they have to go to this area is because they are virtually forced to with real evidence. And it's the real evidence that they can't even overcome with the help of the Holy Ghost. It don't matter what the Holy Ghost testifies to you folks. The Joseph Smith papyri date to Ptolemaic times. The Egyptologists and scholars have demonstrated that fundamentally, conclusively. This is not scholarship guesswork. We can tell by the type of the handwriting. We can tell by the shape of the papyri. We can tell by which words they use and how the syntax of the sentences in the information on the papyri help us see what era the author of these papyri lived in. This is not guesswork. We know the Joseph Smith papyri that Joseph Smith got in Kirtland, 1835, dates to approximately 150 B.C., this is crucial to know. Thank you, Doug Vincent, for that super chat. I appreciate you. This is from my friend, John G. <laughs> He's a cheapskate. It's okay, John. I love you. Thanks for the dough. I'm going to use it to wreck your scholarship. Although Rittner has done a fine job of that. I don't need to. I will rehash it, however. So <laughs> you guys crack me up. Here's to my friends in the chat. So understand... Mormons have been forced with the actual evidence to now look for authenticating factors for the book of Abraham, not in Abraham's day. Those hunibly apologetic times are over, hunibly lost the argument, my great hero of the book of Abraham, Hugh Nibley, lost the argument. He's wrong. It's over. You no longer get to look that far back in antiquity to find authenticating aspects of the book of Abraham. 
because the papyri are way, way later. Now, this used to be considered an anti-Mormon argument. Do you not see the gravity here? Do you not see the deep irony here? It was an anti-Mormon argument to say that the papyri dated way later than Abraham's day. Did you realize that? Now today, the Mormons are so forced into accepting that so-called anti-Mormon argument because of the direct Egyptological, historical, and archaeological evidences that now they have to go to only that era in order to authenticate the book of Abraham. They can't go back into antiquity because those papyri didn't exist then. Do you see this issue clearly? This is critical. It is amazing. And yet they act like, oh, well, this is just normal run-of-the-mill course stuff that, well, now we have to go find authenticity for the book of Abraham in Ptolemaic times. But they won't tell you why they're going to Ptolemaic times. The Mormons and their scholars are going to a much later time, the Ptolemaic times, for one reason only. The Joseph Smith papyri do not date in to Abraham's day, they are late documents. And now the Mormons, in order to retain what very little credibility they hope they have, which they have none, in order to maintain that credibility, they are forced by valid scholarship to now focus and narrow themselves into the Ptolemaic era to find hopeful support for the book of Abraham. They don't get to play the find a parallel at any cost like John Gee and Hugh Nibley used to do and find those parallels way back in antiquity in Mesopotamia and Sumeria and Mesoamerica and Alaska and way down there in Timbuktu in Africa. And hell, why not go to Australia too? There's something there too. No, that, that, phony pony is dead. It's gone. It's over. Now they have to go to this era alone. Oh, <laughs> Todd Vincent, you're rocking my night, man. Thank you. Thank you for the super chat. This is my real donation to the BYP. Yeah, baby, fun. Kick ass. Yeah, baby. There it is. In fact, I'm going to show that one. Yeah, baby. We're going to kick ass tonight. So, and I'm not trying to be overly polemical here. I really am not. Um, I am trying to find clarity. I am trying to seek to understand what makes scholars tick. Now, what was it that made Hugh Nibley tick? It's because he wanted so bad to find authenticity for Joseph Smith and his what? His restoration of what? An ancient time. Now, of course, Hugh Nibley's bread and butter was ancient history, and he was pretty doggone good at it. He was. Some of his stuff is still highly excellent, useful, and fun to read. Unfortunately, he got the apologetic virus. It infected him, and he was sick for the last half of his life defending the book of Abraham, and he wasted 45 years of his life for literally nothing. And that bug, of course, that virus has spread throughout the Mormon scholarship. Well, the inoculation against this silly virus is actual Egyptology. It comes along, and of course, everyone's going to scream against the Egyptologists at first. Well, you guys are guessing, yes, you can translate the language, but we don't really know the meaning. We don't know if that means that. It could have a double or a triple meaning. Now, the interesting thing is it could, 
And there are examples of ancient texts having double and hidden meanings. That's not just a stupid guess. That actually does happen. Is this the case with this Ptolemaic Book of the Dead and Book of Breathings that Joseph Smith acquired? And the answer is no. Because we have other copies of Books of the Dead that match this one really tightly, but they're even more full. The entire Joseph Smith Book of Breathings fits within several other Egyptian Book of Breathings because it's smaller than all of these others. So we actually do have Books of Breathings that we can utilize and compare and check and cross-check. This isn't a wild guessing game. This isn't Egyptologist with their panties in a wad, angry at the Mormons, so they decided to refute them, etc. These are Egyptologists who justifiably and rightly feel like their professional and religious predilections within the realm of Egyptology are being maligned, they're being misinterpreted, they're being misused, they're being mistranslated, and it's ridiculously being used to verify a religion that they don't believe in. And so they're saying enough of the abuse of the ancient Egyptian materials. This is what's going on. Robert Rittner is one of the main ones. We have controls for being able to test to being able to actually not just translate the words, but, well, we don't know what it means. Those days when Nibley made that argument, and I verified this, it's in his message of the Joseph Smith Papyri, it's in his Improvement Era articles, they're up there somewhere. It is true that the Egyptological era, which Hugh Nibley did find that particular issue and problem with was in you ready for a drum roll the late 1800s well no duh Derek of course they're going to be thinking that 125 years ago but Nibley was writing in the 1960s for crying out loud. What are you doing quoting 1800 junk when it was still in its infancy? Of course they were still translating the texts and not understanding them. But did that remain that way? up into Nibley's day. No, it did not. It absolutely did not. And the Egyptologists have an easy time demonstrating that we actually do have some good idea. No, they don't know it all. Nobody does. But they do have a good idea of the various issues happening with the ancient Egyptian religion and Abraham teaching Pharaoh astronomy and sitting on his throne ain't part of that. That's Joseph Smith all the way, right? So we have some very important and interesting serious issues that I want to take up with Smoot and Mulstein. So this cultural setting in Ptolemaic Egypt is because they virtually have no choice. Now the evidence dictates to the Mormons how little they can use of their flights of fancy and cool parallels in order to verify Joseph Smith, it's not happening. Not anymore. Those days are over.
They, of course, want to keep it in that groove. Nope, we've advanced beyond that to the point to where they're going to look so damn stupid still trying to find the parallels in Abraham's day that they now have to do the real thing and actually follow the evidence. And it's kill them. They hate doing that. Why? Because the evidence is all on the side of the Egyptologists, not Joseph Smith. That's a big deal to a believing Mormon. Obviously, it was a big deal to me as an apologist. That's why I was an apologist, right? So let's see what else uh, Smoot and Molstein carry on. So this book of Abraham and the Pearl of Great Price purports to be a translation of the writings of Abraham while he was in Egypt. Now, that was Joseph Smith's description. The story and the controversy surrounding the book of Abraham and the associated Egyptian papyri, once owned by Joseph Smith, is complex and multifaceted. Implica or complications and questions abound regarding the historicity of the book of Abraham, its relationship to the papyri owned by Joseph Smith, the way it was translated, and the prophet's interpretation of the three facsimiles that accompanied the text, given the gaps in the historical record to say nothing of the diverse methodological assumptions that have undergirded different approaches to the text, this subject will give scholars plenty of fodder for continued academic investigation. Woohoo! The Mormons have gotten their asses kicked all over the place with every cotton picking theory they have ever come up with on all of this issue. These guys are playing games. They don't want to let the cat out of the bag that they're now treading water, trying to maintain their faith by their, their, the water is right there at the bottom of their lip and they're treading like crazy and they're starting to get tired and they're going to drown and they know it. That's how this works. Me, I grabbed the lifesaver, uh, the life vest of the Egyptologists and put it on and now I float just fine. The apologists are drowning and they will continue drowning because they don't want to grab that life vest. Here is why this is so problematic. I will go back to, so, and, and this is where they set it up. Now, notice their setup, and, I, and, and this is what made me want to do this video. One question that remains open for examination is how a purported autobiography of the patriarch Abraham could have been transmitted from his time. And they're saying we're talking between 2000 and 1800 BC. So that's way back there, right? Into the Ptolemaic period. How did the book of Abraham get transmitted? When the Joseph Smith papyri were created, see, they are forced to acknowledge that now. That used to be an anti-Mormon argument. I cannot overemphasize that. The Mormons have been forced to accept the anti-Mormon argument because they're horse and pony show of saying it's ancient in Abraham's day has been completely destroyed. So now we get to validate the anti-Mormon argument back in Hugh Nibley's day. Do you not see the thunder here? If you don't, you haven't been paying attention. This is huge. So now this is a journey, the, the journey of the book of Abraham supposedly from Abraham's day, 2000 BC, all the way up to the Ptolemaic times, that's well over a millennia and a half, and they've got an exclamation point on there, and rightly so. So how feasible or 
how likely is it that a copy of Abraham's writings could have been recovered from a point in history so far removed from his own time? How was the text transmitted and when? Who was it transmitted by? And for what purposes was it transmitted through that millennium and a half? And how likely is it that Abraham's writings would have been associated with the collection of funeral papyri seemingly unrelated to anything Jewish or biblical? Now, based on this Ptolemaic era theory that the apologists are pushing, they say these are all valid and important questions that have been addressed in part before us. So to answer the question of how a punitive copy of Abraham's writings could have been transmitted into Greco-Roman Egypt and subsequently into the possession of Joseph Smith, what we will do in this paper first is we want to look at the evidence that demonstrates a Jewish presence in Greco-Roman Egypt. After reviewing this evidence, it will then explore questions related to the direction of cultural exchange between Egyptian and Jewish groups, yada, yada, yada in the spirit of candor. Oh, I love this because I'm going to perform the spirit of candor here in just a few more moments. So in the spirit of candor, Smoot and Molstein say, we acknowledge that this outline for a plausible transmission of the book of Abraham, this rests on an assumption. And that assumption is Joseph Smith had in his possession a physical ancient copy of Abraham's writings. So if one assumes that Joseph Smith translated the book of Abraham in a way comparable to his translation of the parchment of John in D&C 7, and I have made a video on this, that is, as revealed texts that did not exist among the Egyptian papyri he possessed or of a physical copy of which otherwise did not have tangible access to, then much of what we talk about is going to lose most of its significance. After all, some prefer to see the actual papyri, to see the translation of the Book of Mormon as purely revelatory and disassociated from any actual papyri in Joseph Smith's possession. This position is understandable. It has some merit and should be carefully considered. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints itself allows for just such a scenario in its Gospel Topics essay on this subject. They say Joseph Smith did not necessarily have to have a literal translation from the papyri. He could have looked at it and felt inspired and received a revelation of the book of Abraham. May I politely say this is all pure, unadulterated bullshit. Yes? Okay. This is pure, unadulterated bullshit. How do we know this? Why would I say something so shocking? There is a magnificent magician's trick going on right in front of the eyes of all the Mormons with this article. And the magician trick is this. You've got the ball in this hand, but you don't want people to know the ball is in this hand. So you're going to drop this hand as you're talking and waving your hand, etc. And you're going to go, oh, look, there's the ball. And everyone's heads are going to look over there and they're going to go, wow, groovy. There it is. You notice how these guys say some people prefer that it is a revelation process, not a translation, etc. 
My particular take on that is who gives a flying flip about what some people want? That is irrelevant to anything having to do with this subject. Who cares what someone else wants? The question is, what did Joseph Smith himself say? Now, we have a crazy anomaly going on, and it's been going on now pretty much ever since John Gee got on the scene and muddied the water so horrifically that he basically destroyed Mormonism's credibility with anything to do with the Book of Abraham. Not one of the myriads of ridiculous attempts to save the Book of Abraham of John Gee's have actually survived. Nothing he has said is relevant to anything Egyptologically at all, and he's been at it for almost 40 years, and he has produced nothing of value for the Book of Abraham that matches anything having to do with actual Egyptological materials and evidence. It would suck to have that kind of miserable track record. Here's the issue. No apologists will de-emphasize the incredible spiritual and physical importance of the eyewitnesses to the Book of Mormon. The eyewitnesses are the anchor. The eyewitnesses to those gold plates, Joseph Smith had three witnesses. Then he had an additional, on another occasion, eight witnesses, as the official story goes, who physically hefted the plates and turned the leaves and saw those gold plates. This is proof in the Mormons' minds that their testimony of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon based on solid eyewitness testimony is valid and they know the Book of Mormon is true. They will not utilize the eyewitnesses to the papyri, nor to how Joseph Smith described the papyri and what he was doing with them in the same manner that they handled the Book of Mormon witnesses. They ignore what Joseph Smith said. They ignore the eyewitnesses to the papyri and the mummies and what the early leaders of the church were taught by Joseph Smith himself concerning the provenance of the papyri. Joseph Smith, according to one of the early witnesses, I believe it is, oh my goodness, Russell M. Nelson, that's worth posting. Thank you for the super chat. This is from myself, the 12, and Jesus. We all think you're doing a great job. Keep this up, and you'll be getting your second anointing. Yeah, baby! Woo-hoo! Second anointing time. Thank you, Russell M. Nelson. I appreciate that. $200 super chat. $350 super chats. Thank you, all you guys. It's not about the money. It's about the information that is so critically vital and important. Um, and so the eyewitnesses to the papyri are ignored. They are downplayed. They are, when quoted, they are deliberately manipulated. Uh, some information is added to make them say something different than what they said. Or in other cases, some information is taken out of a particular description in order to make them say something else than what they actually said. And then it changes 
the meaning. There has been nothing but straightforward lies and manipulation with the eyewitnesses of the papyri and the mummies from the Mormon apologetic point of view. So if eyewitnesses are such a big whoop to do to establish truth, and I'm not saying they aren't vital, they are. They're not the only answer. However, a lot of Mormons, such as Daniel C. Peterson, makes that case that the strongest evidence for the Book of Mormon is the witness's testimony. You'll never find a Mormon scholar or an apologist say the same thing about the witnesses to the papyri and the mummies that Joseph Smith himself taught them to understand and learn about. You won't see it. John Gee doesn't do it. Kerry Mulstein doesn't do it. Stephen Smoot doesn't do it. Joseph Smith himself taught plainly, and this was repeated, so far as we're aware, H. Michael Marquardt, my dear friend, he has discovered probably six or seven different witnesses and their descriptions. I read them earlier this week. I, I should have took the paper out. I apologize. In my detailed responses, in my detailed uh, redo of all of this material, I will include Marquardt, a very, very important scholarship from my friend Marquardt. Uh, Dan Vogel will verify here in the chat, if you think I'm bluffing, that uh, Marquardt is really the real deal. He is good. So here is the issue. Joseph Smith taught that this book of Abraham that he translated from the papyri was actually penned by Abraham himself. This papyri that we have, now the fragments that were, they were lost after Joseph's death. And they came back in 1967. The church has these fragments. Now we've done a great big, this is my Joseph Smith. Oh, this is my version of the Joseph Smith papers of the uh, book of Abraham. I have put absolutely all the other information that I have uh, on the book of Abraham in this. The thing is like, 3,000 pages. I've been taping stuff together now so that I have a one single go-to source to cover all of the issues of the book of Abraham. I have it all at my fingertips. Joseph Smith taught that the papyri that the church owns right now in Salt Lake City, even though they love to minuscule it, well, they're just tiny, small fragments. And that's irrelevant. Don't let them squirrel. Don't let them give you a sleight of hand and smack you with this hand. Don't do that. We're looking for clarity. Joseph Smith taught that the actual papyri is Abraham wrote his book in Egyptian hieroglyphics, and then he signed it. And I've shown the hieroglyph where Joseph Smith says is Abraham's signature. He said that to people, and they repeated the information. Wilford Woodruff, whom was taught personally by Joseph Smith, while he and others visited Lucy's house to see the mummies and be told about the papyri in one evening, he repeated this information that could have only come from Joseph Smith, that these are the most magnificent days. We have been so blessed with a real prophet Joseph Smith, in line with the biblical prophets who keeps receiving ancient records dealing with the biblical patriarchs, Moses and Enoch and now Abraham. This papyri has been 
hidden in the coffins of the Egyptians for 4,000 years, and they were preserved and saved so that no man saw them or could change them or manipulate them until the right time came for none other than our prophet Joseph Smith to acquire them through the province of God and translate them and restore a lost book of Abraham. Smoot and Molstein are barking up a false tree when they're trying to say there is a plausible way that the book of Abraham through the millennia came trucking down the line in Egypt and it was manipulated and changed. And there's copies of copies. None of that is what Joseph Smith himself said. And you will never see a Mormon scholar or a Mormon apologist who will share this eyewitness description of the papyri anywhere because it destroys Joseph Smith. The scholars today want to have the credibility of the modern Egyptological knowledge, not guesswork, knowledge to validate Joseph Smith, and it doesn't. So they have to ignore Joseph Smith and the eyewitnesses on this issue on the age of the papyri, on Joseph Smith, on, on uh, Abraham's signature on the papyri. The fact that the description is they also had a book of Joseph from ancient Egypt and his penmanship on the papyri, Joseph's penmanship was nicer, it was cleaner, it was clearer and well-written than was Abraham's. We are talking Joseph of Egypt, Abraham, while in Egypt, writing their books on the papyri in the Egyptian hieroglyphic by his own hand upon papyri, then hidden for 4,000 years, only to come forward to the miraculous, charismatic, enhancing favor for Joseph Smith to be able to translate. That's the story. No Mormon wants you to know. Those are the eyewitness accounts that are consistently downplayed, if not outright ignored. And the apologists and scholars have tried every single cotton pick and ridiculous scatterbrained attempt at finding any kind of theory, no matter how freaking stupid, dumb, and muddle headed, in order not to be forced to accept. Joseph Smith's description, which he claimed to receive by revelation from Jesus Christ. <laughs> so the apologists, <laughs> they want us to accept the catalyst theory that, well, it wasn't a direct translation of the papyri. It was a revelation from Jesus Christ where he got the book of Abraham. And yet, they don't want to include the revelation directly from Jesus Christ, according to Joseph Smith, that the papyri are 4,000 flipping years old and that Abraham wrote it himself and it's been hidden all this time. And now he's translating it from the power of God giving him the knowledge of the hieroglyphics. <laughs> so on the one hand, they want you to believe in revelation. And on the other hand, oh, hell no, we can't accept that revelation. You see how manipulative 
everything is with the LDS scholarship on the book of Abraham and Joseph Smith's understanding of the provenance of the papyri. They cannot just let Joseph Smith tell you his revelation and accept it. Because the modern Egyptologists have completely annihilated that revelation. In other words, the modern Egyptology now demonstrates without much of a question whatsoever that Joseph Smith was making it up. The crazy thing here. <laughs> this, is, this is a wild ride. Every LDS scholar who studies Egyptology, who translate the papyri, none of them ever get the book of Abraham. They always get the translation that Klaus Baer, Richard Parker, John Wilson, and Robert Rittner get. <laughs> when they translate the hieroglyphs, there's no mention of Enoch's pillar. There's no mention in the papyri of Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of judgment. There's no description of Jacob's ladder. And yet all of these are eyewitness descriptions of the Mormon prophet's explanations of what the papyri had on them. And yet no one today gets any of that. And Smoot and Molstein, in this just a couple of months ago, this written article, want us to imagine that there's a plausible scenario for the book of Abraham to come trucking down through the ages and finally show up in Ptolemaic Egypt? Are these guys serious? Apparently they are. But you'll notice they don't quote Joseph Smith, do you? Oh, heavens no, because that kills their case. In other words, these guys are stalling for time. They're out of options. The real knowledge of the papyri is here, and it's here to stay, and it's not guesswork. This is when the papyri were written, 150 B.C. Joseph Smith said they're 4,000 thousand years old, and they were written by Abraham himself. Now, there's another really crazy aspect of this that I can't help it. I've got to share it with you tonight. When it dawned on me what this particular piece of evidence showed, it shocked me that I had not seen it earlier because it is so blatantly obvious. Now, the, the Mormon scholarship are attempting to present a scholarly side of this. Now, and, and no joke, you look into their articles, which I do, and you read their footnotes, which again, I do. And you check out the German and the sumptuous French and Italian and linguistic voodoo and Australian pictograms and Native American sand painting symbolisms, etc. When you look through all their footnotes and you see the attempts at trying to be so credibly scholarly, it's mind boggling how utterly, embarrassingly simple their defense destroys Joseph Smith's translation of the book of Abraham. And I'm talking about, just bear with me for a moment. Here's where you have to have a little bit of history. 
right? And I love David McAvoy. David McAvoy, shout out to you, brother, because he brought this out in his book on the Old Testament. Uh, Schwindwind on how the Bible came to be. I've got it around here somewhere. He is also one of the very excellent scholars. Understand the problem here. In this fabulous book, Producing Ancient Scripture by McKay, Mark Amherst McGee, and Brian M. Hauglid, uh, Joseph Smith's translation projects in the development of Mormon Christianity, there is a gentleman here who has written simply one of the most magnificent chapters on this subject that I have ever read, totally all-inclusive, scholarly, erudite, very enlightening. He is holding nothing back. It is a tremendously fantastic effort on his part, and I commend him heartily for what obviously is years of research into this. I am duly impressed with this man's scholarship. I'm not bluffing. Matthew J. Gray, chapter 16, Approaching Egyptian Papyri Through Biblical Language, Joseph Smith's use of Hebrew in his translation of the book of Abraham. His analysis, I want to do a, a whole video on, it is the largest chapter in the book. It is absolutely magnificent. Now, here's the issue. And he does, he's subtle, he's careful. He, he's trying to be, he's trying to attempt a credible approach to this, pros and cons. And he's not trying to defend Joseph Smith. He's not trying to refute Joseph Smith. He's simply attempting as objectively scholarly as possible, something no one at farms ever did, nor can they still at the interpreter. They are as subjective and biased as they always have been. This man genuinely shoots for that objectivity mark. For the most part, I think he does very well. Here's the catch. When you approach it with that manner, unlike this Smoot Molstein article that I'm responding to, and all of this that I'm saying is a direct response to their claptrap, he cannot, by virtue of his position within the church as one of the church's scholars, Brother Gray can not take it to the final conclusion. Or they will kick him out. I said that correctly. Matthew J. Gray is to be commended for exquisite scholarship on this vast, utterly fascinating subject. It is no wonder that Joseph Smith's followers were just bowled over by the prophet, sincerely. Back then, had you lived and seen what Joseph Smith did, you too would have been bowled over. This is entirely understandable on my perspective. Uh, I would have been the Orson Pratt of that day, except I wouldn't have acquiesced to Brigham Young. I would have kicked his ass and chucked him in the creek, but that's just me. Here is what Gray cannot do in this exquisite study, which I highly recommend that you read. There is an attempted partial translation of the book of Abraham, you know, within just a couple of days, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery on examining papyri said, oh, hey, uh, gosh, we found much to our delight. Hey, there's the book of Abraham. Whoa, bonus. There's the book of Joseph. Well, they did an attempt at uh, an alphabet first and a grammar and then a translation in 1835, 1836, etc. And then life caught up to him. And it wasn't until way later, 
after he studied Hebrew using Sykes's, Sykes's, I don't know how to pronounce, I've always, I know it's S-E-I, but E before, Sykes's, however you pronounce the gentleman's name. In the later portions of the translation of the book of Abraham, as well as in some of the explanations, in facsimile number two, etc., the astronomical ideas, we begin to see this usage of Hebrew in an ancient book of Abraham record after Joseph Smith studied Hebrew with a Hebrew scholar with several of the brethren, and then all of a sudden Hebrew starts showing up in the ancient book of Abraham that dates 4,000 years ago in Abraham's day, who penned the Egyptian hieroglyphics on his own papyri, signed it with his signature, and included Hebrew descriptions and words of the cosmos and a very interesting theological information in an age a thousand years before Hebrew ever existed. Hebrew in a book Joseph Smith is translating from a language to English, dating to a specific time, Hebrew cannot be in the book of Abraham. It wasn't in existence. This ends up, rather than authenticating Joseph Smith's spiritual translation capabilities as a true prophet of God, being guided by, some said the Urim and Thummim, some said the Holy Ghost, etc. I don't care, pick your poison, it's irrelevant to me. The fact is, rather than authenticating Joseph Smith, Hebrew is the most damning evidence against Joseph Smith, demonstrating unequivocally that he's just making stuff up. It can't be there. That's the conclusion Brother Gray can't take it to. But his analysis of the fact that Joseph Smith is using Hebrew in an ancient record that Joseph Smith is bringing forth that has never been seen by anyone from Abraham's day until Joseph Smith got the papyri from Michael Chandler, there is no way Hebrew could be there. And yet there it is. I had never quite seen it in that light before. This is astonishing. You want proof Joseph Smith was just making stuff up? You can't do better than go to the Hebrew in the book Abraham. I never realized that. I actually was defending Joseph Smith once as an apologist that the Hebrew actually demonstrated Joseph Smith's prophetic power, etc. Now, Dan Vogel in his book, and I've had him on the show just recently, and I have also explored his book on the charisma under pressure. What this did... As if Egyptian hieroglyphic isn't enough, then all of a sudden you've got the Hebrew. I mean, this is mind boggling to his followers. Wow, is there any, you've got reformed Egyptian on the gold plates. Is there anything this man can't do? He translates a parchment of John through a vision. Is there anything this Superman can't do? I mean, it's 
obvious he is a man of God and God is with him. Look at this incredible treasure of ancient knowledge being brought back in our day. And it's all just a puff of smoke. <laughs> of <Not> it's <much> real. <laughs> This is crazy beans, man. I, I'm just saying, wow. So, Smoot and Molstein, I'm singularly unimpressed because you won't, you can't. I, I get it. You can't. Yeah, I, I get it. You can't, but I can. You can't give us the full understanding of Joseph Smith's understanding of the papyri of Abraham, etc. All you're stuck with is finding a few insignificant, stupid, meaningless ancient parallels. And now your real ancient parallels that Hugh Nibley spent 45 years finding and writing thousands of pages and book after book after book after book on, none of that's valid anymore either because now you are forced to go only to Ptolemaic times, which refused Joseph Smith's claims. So it's no surprise, I get it, you can't give us the full historical evidence because you wouldn't be able to remain a Mormon scholar if you did and claim you believe the Book of Abraham is a genuine, authentic, translated ancient text written by Abraham himself. I mean... I would really hate to be in that position. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's brutal. But that is the issue. So let's look again. I'll go back to their discussion here. Additionally, there are those who have speculated that the book of Abraham might be a pseudepigraphic text composed by a Jewish author during the Greco-Roman period. Much of what is laid out in this paper may be highly relevant to this line of thinking. And if that's the case, then why the hell are you even writing the stupid paper? Do you not understand what pseudepigrapha is? Pseudepigrapha is not scripture. Richard Bushman, and I've done a video on this, you guys. Richard Bushman, just recently, actually, uh, has come out and boldly said that the book of Abraham is actually a pseudepigraphic text. That is not helping. The, to to uh, elaborate, to claim the book of Abraham is a pseudepigraphic text of Joseph Smith means he made this shit up himself. None of it's authentically ancient. None of it's restored. None of it's genuinely translated. It's Joseph Smith writing a story about Abraham. That is what pseudepigrapha is. Do you Mormons not yet get that? Really? I mean, we've been studying pseudepigrapha now for decades, you guys. Come on. Bart Ehrman, one of the most popular biblical scholars on the planet, in his book Forged, describes pseudepigrapha very, very well. It does not help your case that you're claiming it's pseudepigrapha. Every one of the books of Enoch one, two, three, and four, and five, Enoch. All of those are simply someone making their own vision of what they hope is real. They're making up a story. It's a concoction. It's a, it's a dog and pony show. It's not real. It's not ancient history. It authenticates nothing, and it certainly was not written by Enoch. It has nothing to do with validating Enoch as a historical reality like Hugh Nibley attempted to do in his book, Enoch the Prophet. And I have reviewed that book also in a video to now claim that the book of Abraham is pseudepigrapha and therefore this line of reasoning works with this study we're doing is to completely give up the ghost. You lost. Your article is a waste of 
time. It has no scholarly validity whatsoever to support Joseph Smith as a true prophet and as a translator of a genuine ancient book of Abraham text. You mean to tell me you are acquiring a PhD and the gentleman you're writing this article with has been a PhD for decades. You mean to tell me it takes a backyard professor, nobody, to show you the actual light on the serious, fatal problem that you guys are presenting and you're not even batting an eye you're pretending this is actual scholarship when it's nothing more than fake bunk wow that's a hell of a compliment <laughs> for me <laughs> i can see far more clearly than you in all of your doctoral learnedness. Because I don't have to end on a conclusion that please people who are in charge of my spirituality like you do. I am in charge of my spirituality. Me and God. It's up to me and God. I don't have to do anything except what God wants me to. Anybody here on earth who says otherwise, I don't have to worry about. If they say, well, no, you have to have this certain conclusion. Uh-uh, I follow the evidence. Obviously, you guys invent and craft and manipulate the evidence in order to give us a paper with, what, 109 footnotes and make it look snappy and jazzy and all that. Who cares? It's worthless. That's your problem, not mine. I'm just pointing out to you why I find this kind of scholarship to be entirely against you and your credibility. And apparently you can't see that because you keep kicking out this stupid waste of time, fluff, pap, and pablum, because the church... The Church of Restored Truth is not allowing you to come to the knowledge of the truth. You have to have faithful history. And it's phony. And I'm very grateful that I have the freedom away from that kind of phoniness, I can legitimately and justifiably, which is really glorious to have this kind of freedom, I can follow the evidence where the evidence leads. And it can mean something. Here. Here. So, I mean, I have ranted and raved now for an hour and 15 minutes, and I did not mean to rant and rave, and yet in so many ways I did did mean to rant and rave because the other aspect that I have uh, treated somewhat extensively and I have much more uh, information I have acquired since I made my Book of Abraham videos just a year ago, in fact, is this theme of a biblical provenance for the papyri. Yeah. That is as negative against any authenticating of Joseph Smith or the Book of Abraham as him inventing and putting Hebrew into the Book of Abraham, pretending like it enhances the book's value when all it shows is that Joseph Smith is faking it. It's the exact same thing with the biblical provenance of the papyri of which no one, Mormon and non-Mormon alike, nobody accepts that. Nobody accepts the biblical providence, unless you're in Sunday school. And then you automatically fall into Mormon speak, and you bear your testimony of what a great prophet Abraham was, and that 
Enoch's pillar was on the papyri, and Abraham really loved Enoch, and so he honored him by drawing his pillar on the papyri and then signing the papyri. I mean, who knows what kind of ridiculous, stupid, crazy crap these guys say when it comes to Mormon speak. But you can't go into an academic setting and get away with that. Why do you think you can get away with it in a church setting? You can't if I attend your Sunday school class. Not going to happen if I go there. So that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to cover. This brand new, I think it's just a couple of months old. Now understand, since this article was published, and, and this is why I want to update the uh, the Book of Abraham uh, materials and videos that I made a year ago, if you think that was good, and, and it was, um, I have a much more extensive uh materials that I want to include. Um, some of these videos are going to end up being like John DeLynn's. I'm serious. I'm going to do six hour videos. So because I want the full clarity, I want the full information. Get away from me, fly. Ooh, super fly. See, I got rid of seven flies just like that. Um, the, this material uh, needs updated because since uh, Smoot and Molstein wrote this article, a, an entire uh, BYU studies might be the quarterly. I'm not sure. Anyway, it's like 390 pages with all kinds of gobbledygook from 15 or 20 different Mormon scholars is devoted to the book of Abraham and the authenticity of it. And, of course, it's a case of massive parallelomania. And John Gee, of course, gets his feet wet in it. And Steve Smoot, Carrie, this might actually be one of the chapters that was put into that uh, edition of the BYU studies. So they're trying to overwhelm you with magnificence. And look, there's parallels over here in Mesopotamia, and in the old kingdom, and the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom of Egypt. Look, we have found stuff in Peru and who knows what they've got, right? But I'm going to do an extensive review and analysis of all of that information. Um, and I guarantee you, and, and I have not read it yet. I will. Uh, I've just been very busy. My intention is to read it this year and to begin a new updated version, but I have not read it, and I can predict without fail that what I've talked about tonight with the eyewitnesses to the papyri and the mummies, that will not be discussed. I can prophesy that with complete immunity of fear. I guarantee you they will not give you the background that I gave you tonight in this video, in that BYU studies, uh, because they can't. They can't let you know what Joseph Smith actually said because they're attempting to be credible in today's world. It's very important for them to have credibility with the scholarship today. In order to do that, you really can't use Joseph Smith. Now, isn't that crazy? Because they then turn around in church and testify, I know that Joseph Smith is a Drew Broad. You don't know diddly spit. You're simply repeating brain dead what the church tells you your testimony is supposed to sound like. Because you won't do that in an academic setting. And what you won't do in an academic setting, you damn sure hypocritically should never do in church, and yet it's done all the time. See, that's part of the problem within Mormonism. You're never allowed to have the truth in the church of truth. I... Wow, I, I don't see how it can get any more ironic as far as I'm concerned. So that's it. Thank you for all your super chats. Appreciate all your support and love. Uh, I hope you guys had uh, a good evening tonight. I've really enjoyed doing this stuff. Um, I, I'm going to share a lot more of this. this. This is still my favorite subject because they keep trying to update it, you know, producing ancient scripture and, and uh, they keep, they keep attempting to find relevance, but in the process, my advantage is I was involved with this particular subject, so I know what they used to say, and I can see now what parts of what used to be their testimonies 
are being slowly let go of quietly and they're not bringing it up anymore and they won't reference it, etc. In fact, they want you to try to forget you ever knew that. And the new generation, of course, will never know that unless they watch these kind of videos. For those of us who know the fuller historical context, they're giving us again whitewashed history. It has never changed. It never will. That's the only truth the church can share with you in order to convince you that it's true is a whitewashed, incomplete, very selective truth. And if that doesn't blow you away for irony, I don't know what possibly can, because that is exquisitely wild. So thanks for watching my Backyard Professor videos, live shows, support. Appreciate all your love and efforts. Um, and I will see you soon on the next BYP Live.